I'm Paul Van Squike of Taekwondo Guide, and this is Topic Tuesday. Welcome. Let's jump right into our topics. From William West. Maybe you'd be interested in doing a video about why Taekwondo doesn't get the respect it deserves and why it should be respected because it has the best kicks in the world, in my opinion. McDojos ruin these great traditional martial arts. Thank you so much, William. It sounds to me like you're really concerned with how other people view Taekwondo. To me, this is indicative of you wanting to gain some sort of social credit in a positive way, positive social credit, through your practice of Taekwondo. Simplified, you want people to think Taekwondo is cool. And by engaging in Taekwondo, you want to boost your cool points. Doing a little mind reading here, maybe that's not what you think, but that's what I'm getting from this. Let's talk about what it takes to be cool. To be cool, something has to be an outlier. Generally, it can't be practical. It can't be mundane. If it's one of those things, it looks too everyday. It doesn't catch eyes. It doesn't stand out. You know I like car analogies. Toyota Camrys are never going to be cool. If you take something and put nitrous in it, like some kind of Hellcat, and you make it just fly off the line so you can win every drag race, and you put racing tires on it, it's not practical, and therefore it stands out because not a lot of people have something like that. Because not a lot of people find it reasonable to put the time and energy and money into having something like that. But then the person that does stands out and that car can do something most cars can't. It can scream off the line and make all kinds of wild sounds. It stands out. And a lot of people will look at that and go, that's really cool. But again, it's something they're not seeing all the time. And that's why a Camry really just can't be that cool because we see them all the time all over the place. Now, does that mean a Camry is disrespected? Camry is chosen by all sorts of people all over the world. It's often the, the number one four-door sedan in all sorts of countries because it's known to be a practical and reliable car. It's very much respected, but it's not cool. So is Taekwondo respected? I think it is. It's probably the most widely practiced martial art in the world. And lots of people feel totally safe enrolling in Taekwondo classes. Lots of mothers are happy to send their five-year-olds to practice Taekwondo. It's got a mass appeal to it. It's the martial art that everybody does. Now, why is that? Well, it's not that extreme generally speaking. It's not something that you're going to go to to class and like get into a serious fight situation. It's not something that you're going to take and use in the octagon exclusively. Standalone Taekwondo is very accessible. I have 60 year old students who do it. Now, if you look at something like Muay Thai, not a lot of 60 year olds doing that. It's something that is incredibly hard on the body. Watch a Muay Thai fight. I'm sure people die in Muay Thai fights. <laughs> look how hard they're getting hit. Look how much damage they take. Look how it doesn't lend itself to old age at all or young age. Outside of Thailand, you don't see a lot of five year olds doing Muay Thai. It's not as accessible. 
Makes it a little more cool, though, doesn't it? Because how many people are going to do that? How many people are going to stick their hand in the fan like that? That's why it stands out. That's why it has immediate social credibility in terms of cool. Telling people you do Taekwondo is kind of like telling them you have a Camry. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a practical martial art for most people to do. It's going to fit with their lifestyle much better than doing hardcore Muay Thai usually would. But don't go thinking that your Camry is going to earn you extra credibility. <laughs> That's where you run into trouble. You have to be honest about what you do and not overhype it. Taekwondo being accessible is a good thing. Let's talk about McDojo's for a second. I don't really like the term because it denigrates martial arts schools that are designed for average people. Most of my students come here two, three times a week and they use martial arts as a vehicle to improve their lives. None of them are going to go win professional kickboxing fights with their training here. In order to do that, you need to go to a school that trains you to be a professional kickboxer. That school is going to have very limited appeal. So you'd need to go to some kind of densely populated area just to have enough people gathered to do something like that. You wouldn't get small town martial arts schools that are putting out kickboxers, professional kickboxers. You have like two students in a small town who'd be willing to subject themselves to the kind of training severity it takes to get to an elite level like that. Now, are those guys cool? Yeah, they're like elite athletes. They stand out. Are they, are they engaged in something that's practical for most people to be engaged in? No. What are you going to get from doing Taekwondo at an average level? You'll build strength, flexibility. You'll work your cardiovascular system. You'll develop balance, coordination, confidence. You'll learn to use your body in efficient ways that can be useful for self-defense. You'll learn some aspects of fighting. You will be a better fighter than if you didn't do any Taekwondo at all. You won't be comparable to elite combat sport athletes. That again is like comparing your Toyota Camry to some kind of specialized sports car. But if you want to go on a road trip, you want the Camry, you don't want that drag strip machine that's all stripped down, has no creature comforts, consumes gas at six miles to the gallon, and has parts on it that are going to fall apart in the middle of your road trip. You want something practical that fits what you're doing for the situation. Now, of course, there are outliers in Taekwondo. There are Olympic level athletes, elite level athletes. They do have extraordinary kicks. And I think those kicks are respected. In fact, you can watch lots of different MMA fighters use the kicks of Taekwondo to win professional MMA matches. I don't think anybody criticizes Taekwondo for its kicks. The criticism of an elite Taekwondo fighter is simply that they have a narrow set of skills that they've developed to a high level at least. So if you took an Olympic Taekwondo athlete and plopped them into a professional kickboxing environment where the variables go up in terms of how many different techniques and so forth that you can do, the rules are broader, they're almost certainly going to lose unless they get a lucky kick early. Their skill set's just a little bit more narrow. That's a fair criticism. It's really not a problem if you're only concerned with being a Taekwondo fighter. It's not a problem at all. It's only a problem if you want to do something broader with your Taekwondo knowledge. Now, if you simply recognize that if you want to 
take your Taekwondo and move into other combat sports, you need to learn about those combat sports, then again, it's really not an issue at all. Nobody criticizes Kendo for only using a stick. They understand that it's a closed sport with limited variables. Let's go on to the second com comment or topic. We've got Carmen San Martin who writes, for another Tuesday, I propose a topic. Could you talk about the principles and values of Taekwondo, such as perseverance or integrity, and why they are so important? For me, Taekwondo is not only a sport. Perseverance and integrity. To me, those things exist just as much in the world of sports as they do in strictly traditional martial arts with no competition. Any competitive athlete needs tremendous perseverance. They're going to lose and they have to persevere through those losses. They're going to need to practice a lot and they've got to persevere through all those practices, all the discipline it takes to get good at a sport. Integrity is always encouraged in the world of sports. Fair play, good sportsmanship. So to me, these two things that you've, you've mentioned, these two principles, exist just as much in the sport world. Now, where I think sports and non-competitive martial arts practice differs tremendously is what it's designed to do for your life, what it looks like in the life of a practitioner. Because winning is such an important aspect of sports, you're pretty much going to have to be a teenager or someone in your early 20s to be able to realistically compete in most sports. Of course, there are exceptions, but generally, sports are for the young. And once you get a little bit older, what activities do you have available that promote a healthy lifestyle, that improve all the areas of your life that martial arts improves, that are accessible in the way that traditional martial arts are. There's not a lot of options. So traditional martial arts is a great long-term practice for overall life improvement. Whereas sports, I think, is a highly focused thing that unless you're a professional athlete, constitutes a very small part of your life. The way I view tr traditional martial arts is you chip away a little bit each day, so you work to get better in a very long-term, broad context. And maintenance is a big part of it. You just work on keeping yourself at a certain state, a, a good physical state. Whereas sports is about gearing yourself up at high speed to dominate in a set of events or a single event. They're both supposed to be about gaining a net value in your life, but sports gets a little bit skewed because winning is such an important part of the, of the overall practice. And of course it has the oddness of having a professional component to it uh, where people have to do things at extremes again in order to make it their career. For most people, casual sports or something akin to a traditional martial art is going to be more practical than hammering away to try to get to that professional status where they're probably not going to ever uh, make it. And if they do, it's a real hard life. It's, it's not cut out for a lot of people, right? So that, to me, is the big difference between a sport and a purely traditional martial art. What is it designed to do for your life? What's the longevity of the practice? Okay, next topic. This is from Sideways OJ, who writes, regarding topics, have you done a video on the value or purpose of patterns, slash pumse? That's another one a lot of skeptics like to poke at. That move is dumb. That would never work in a real fight. What is that supposed to teach? You're just kicking air, etc. Great topic. I love Pumse. I 
really enjoy the practice with a group of people, the feeling of being synced up and doing these movements together. What's the value of it combatively? Let's break down the, the words first. Pum se. If you translate that, it means articles on cultivating strength. Pum se is a word specific to Taekwondo. If you go back to Taekwondo's predecessor, Tang Sudo, it's called Hyung. That's the same word in Korean as kata in Japanese. It's written using the same hanja. That means something a little bit different. It means something like to carve into the earth, referring to the pattern you make on the ground when you perform the kata or hyung. Pumse, articles on cultivating strength. If we take that definition literally, we can assume that Taekwondo uses pumse as a vehicle to develop fitness in its practitioners. I think it does a fantastic job of that. The long stances and the kicks that require you to lock out at full extension and hold at the apex, those go a long way in building leg and hip strength that's really useful in sparring. There's something about the connectedness of the body, the coordination you get from doing pumse in general, that is, I think, tremendously valuable in martial arts. And you learn to prep your body so that you're building torque and then unwind that torque, which generally speaking is a really powerful concept for striking. So it's got a good set of physical components that you can then pour into other parts of your martial arts training. Is it the most effective route to getting good at fighting? I don't think so. Is it useful for fighting and a cultural, a vehicle for exploring culture? Let's put it that way. Is it useful for fighting and a vehicle for exploring culture and a group discipline and something you can demonstrate and something that you can pass throughout history? It's, it's that. It's all of those things. Is it a standalone best practice to get to fighting prowess? No, I don't think so. It does, it does have value for fighting, like I say, but its overall value is larger. You have to appreciate it for all of those things. Now, if you go back far enough in history, you would have had partner exercises that people did in martial arts systems like Southern Chinese Kung Fu, Okinawan Karate. And the techniques that were done with a partner would have then been put into these patterns and performed in the air. That's what your first kata would have been. Now these get passed down over time from instructor to instructor. And as the martial arts modernized, they lost touch with these original partner, partner drills. But you can look at wrestlers, boxers, they still do shadow boxing, shadow wrestling. They still do a sort of form of, of pumse as a way of practicing what they do with a partner when nobody's around. Is that what forms are today? I think they're strongly divorced from those early applications because the meaning was, was lost throughout time when the, the purpose of martial arts shifted from pure combat and self-defense to a sport and way of life. You can do a lot of archaeology to uncover the original purpose of the techniques in your Taekwondo Pumse. But in order to make them useful to you, you then have to do the partner exercises they were plucked from, and take those partner exercises and put them into some kind of live training, which shouldn't look like normal sparring. It should be more of a self-defense-based type of sparring. You do all of that, 
and you're going to have something that looks like southern Chinese kung fu. It doesn't look much like modern taekwondo or karate. This is something I love to do. I've got a small group that I practice this with at least once a week. Uh, so it's a skill I've been trying to build for years and uh, it's work in progress but I find it quite enjoyable. There's something about playing archaeologist and trying to suss out the purpose of these techniques that I find most intriguing. Now one thing I should note is if you're trying to get direct representations of these partner exercises out of the Taekwondo Pumse, it's going to be very hard to find them because the Taekwondo Pumse that most people practice now were designed in the 1970s. They are far removed from the old Okinawan forms that these movements come out of. So <laughs> you can sort of take the ones that you find in the old Okinawan forms and find the original applications to and play with the pieces that work. But I think there's a lot in modern Taekwondo Pumse that's just there for artistic purposes. If you look at the second degree black belt form, Kumgang, you'll see this mountain block all the time. And the block, it, is, it looks just like the character for mountain, Kumgang. It looks identical to that Chinese character. Now, if you look in a textbook, it will say that this block is to protect yourself from someone punching you on either side of your body. That doesn't ever happen, right? It's, it's a rare that something like that would come up. So, it's probably just that the, the founders like the artistic expression of those sets of movements more than they understood what the movement was supposed to be in its original context. It's a great topic. I'd love to dig into more, but we'll call that good for today's Topic Tuesday. If you have a topic you'd like me to discuss for next week's Topic Tuesday, please drop it down there in the comments, and I'll keep these things going. Thank you so much for your interest. Until next time.